my name is Kostya, Konstantin Osipov. I am from Moscow, and here I'm going to talk about lightweight transactions. And uh, usually I do accept questions during the talk, so uh, I think we can do it uh, today as well, so let's try it. This is a pretty serious presentation. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not good at jokes. I'm more about database stuff, you know, I've been doing databases for a long time. So, uh, and this is, uh, I got initially a slot of 30 minutes, and I have 40 slides. I might, might not make it in 40 minutes, and some serious stuff is at the end. So bear with me. And let's uh, begin quickly. Uh, many of you obviously uh, wish to get lightweight transactions in Scylla and have like most burning questions. Are they there? Are they, re are they ready? How can I get them? So I prepared this slide with quick takeaways. The, the support for lightweight transactions was committed to master. Uh, the Docker containers will soon be available for you and uh, this is where you can get them. Uh, there is a quick tutorial I put up which you can play with. So uh, if you know what lightweight transactions are, if you know how to use them, you could probably have a coffee instead of listening here, so enjoy. And for those of you who, who would like to know, uh, would like to know the details of the implementation, benchmarks, some metrics, some future work. For example, we have, still we have experiment, ex, I'm sorry, experimental, experiment, experimental switch on them and why we have it, when we remove it, so then stay on with me on this talk. This is how the talk is structured. I already explained that we will begin with the syntax, semantics, we will review what this feature is. Then uh, we will look at design and implementation, show some benchmarks, they are fair. So this is benchmarks, not benchmarking. And uh, um, then we talk about the design. So understanding the design helps understand the limits of applicability of a feature. And uh, finally, we will get to caveats and uh, future work, how we plan to remove all of this or make them shine and be, and be really, really beautiful feature in Scylla. So uh, before we begin with lightweight transactions, uh, let's discuss the problem, what the problem is. So those of you who are familiar with Scylla know that data modification statements in Scylla do not return a result set. So you don't know whether there was a row or there wasn't a row, and if there wasn't a row that was updated, then there will, there will be. So the reason for this is that Scylla is built for high write availability. So high throughput of writes and high availability uh, of uh, the cluster. You can write at any node, any node will accept your write and it will try to perform it quickly. Here I try to draw a write path of a mutation in Scylla. So it goes to the coordinator, then it goes to replicas, and well, this is not a very fair picture because I don't assume a shard aware driver, so most often it goes to re straight to the first replica. But let's assume it goes to a replica, and a write on a replica doesn't really read anything. That's an important part. It, it usually uh, just appends the, the write to the in-memory table, and appends the write to the commit log, which is very quick because the commit log is batched, so you, you flush uh, lots of writes to disk at once. So this is how we achieve high write throughput. And uh, the underlying data structure for that is log structured merge trees, uh, which, uh, which basically support this write scenario. And uh, log structured merge trees are not good for reads. Basically, you can assume that they are 100 times slower for reads than there are for, write, for writes. There are some special cases that when they that can be faster than that, but in general case, it can be 100 times and even more slower. So this is why writes are fast and they, why writes are, do not return the result set. The other reason why writes do not return the result set is uh, client-side timestamps. So eventual consistency model assumes that you can actually assign a timestamp on a client and uh, the history of mutations is built eventually. You know, you merge all of the mutations from all of the replicas, it's a concurrent update can change the same record on another replica, and you can even retroactively change the history by adding a new mutation with an old timestamp. So even if you get the record back, 
you wouldn't know what to do with it. You know, it can, might be obsolete or it might become obsolete. This is great, but this is not what you always want. So to give you an example, uh, here, this is a, an SQL user trying to use CQL and expecting that this uh, statement is going to update a record about John Doe in the table. And accidentally, it actually inserts the record. So the John Doe wasn't hired before, now it's hired, and it's hired with this join date. This is, not something what you, this is not something you always need. Sometimes you need a reliable database, which still is, a scalable database, but a traditional consistency model. Like, I want to, to update my change to the latest version of data, and I want to make sure that whoever is coming after me actually sees my rights before, apply, before a new update is applied. And you can also see that workload semantics in Scylla is actually used to provide values. So the, this clause is taken, and a new clause is introduced, if clause, uh, to convey the meaning, the intent to the database. Hey, hey, I don't want to insert the record if it's not there. And this is why uh, lightweight transactions are sometimes called conditional updates or conditional statements. So you can see that in this case, the statement is not applied. And uh, uh, you get, basically, you get what you want from the database. So what else can you do with lightweight transactions? Uh, the, the conditional clause here, it can be uh, quite rich. So you, you, can, you can use conditions with all data manipulation statements. It's inserts, updates, deletes. Uh, there are some shortcuts, like you can, uh, you can do if exists, if not exists, if you just want to check the record. You can, um, use multi, you can use expressions, you can use in, in predicate, you can use less than, greater than. So it's very similar to where close. And uh, here I created a few examples. Uh, so we are going to discuss that uh, lightweight transactions are more expensive than ordinary statements, than eventually consistent statements. And in these examples, I try to actually uh, come up with um, good patterns for lightweight transactions. So you don't always, you, you don't use it for all of your data. You use it for some critical pieces of your data where you, you do need strong consistency. So in this case, like bookings, uh, you don't want to make a booking twice, right? If there is a, 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 if a booking is made already, you don't want to make it twice. And uh, another, another set of use cases is introduced by lightweight transactional batches, so conditional batches. What are conditional batches? A state, if, a, if a batch has a conditional statement, at least one, the entire batch is transactional. The entire batch is applied atomically, all or nothing, and also the entire batch uh, has a consistent read view of data. What it means, if you have multiple conditional sta statements in the batch, all of the statements have the same view of data, and it's guaranteed to be the latest view. Uh, it's guaranteed to be the latest view. By the way, stop me or speed me up if I'm, I'm saying something trivial. So I can, I can skip that. But I really, I really thought it's, it's important to just look at the basics first. So a conditional batch has the latest view of the data, and uh, mm, Essentially, conditional batches are very similar to classical transactions in traditional databases. Uh, the only difference is that if you have multiple conditions in the batch, there is no like else branch. If any of the condition is not true, it's do nothing, right? So you could probably branch your logic in a, in a classical database. You cannot do it with a batch. I, here, I use an example uh, I created an example where you can actually do something useful with the batch. So I have a static cell and abandoned, and ha I have a partition where there are uh, all of the tasks that are associated with the project. So in this example, I atomically update a static cell and delete all of the abandoned tasks in the project. So this is, this is, this is a case when you might want to uh, put, uh, we might want to use a conditional batch to do multiple changes atomically. And I've been, just a second. 
No questions so far? So far, it's like yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the batch statement, the the conditions have a single view of the table. Of the data, yes, of the, the data, the latest view. Yes. But what is the latest view, since we're talking about eventual consistency? I'll get to that. OK, thank you for the question. So just wait a second. So we have been talking about uh, consistency and uh, like traditional consistency. Uh, there are many, many consistency levels in Scylla. Like there is quorum, all, any. And you might ask, what consistency? Are we adding new consistency levels? Are we using? Uh, existing levels. So um, in, uh, lightweight transactions are in a bit of its own world. They add its own consistency statement. So, uh, and you can, uh, this is a, a grammar example. So this is a SQL part of, a, of setting default consistency. Uh, there is a serial and local serial. And this is like independent from other consistency levels. Uh, what this consistency means? You, so, and, I, and let me address the question. You, when you execute the condition, you actually read data. So the order of execution is like, you search for the rows, you check conditions, and if the conditions are true, you apply updates. So when you, when you check the conditions, you read some version of data. In order to make sure that the version of data that you read is the latest version, lightweight transactions actually do not allow you to assign a timestamp to your writes. So they select a timestamp for you. And this is how all, all the uh, or new data is, so it's, this is how we ensure that the latest view is used when checking conditions. And the serial, serial and local serial uh, set whether it's the latest view from the data center or from the entire cluster. So I will get to, this is usually, and you know, it's like using local serial is a bit of a, you know, advanced usage. Uh, I, I say it, you cannot have a partially rotten egg, so you can have only serial consistency, and uh, serial consistency is the default. But in some cases, if you know what you're doing, you can use local serial, and you can actually tweak the standard consistency setting to improve performance, reduce latency. If you get, if you have time, we'll get to that. Uh, I've been saying that if is very similar to where. I also said that conditions are checked after searching the row. This is an important difference of if close and where close. So uh, where close actually can use a secondary index and can filter records at storage level. If close is applied afterwards, so it's like a predicate. If the predicate is true, we continue. If it's not true, we hold. How else are conditions different? Uh, they also apply to the search row. They also can use expressions. For now, not all expressions are available. This has to do with some reconciliations we need to do with the features we added recently. Eventually, the expression grammar, the expression power will be pretty much the same. And some of the functions are not allowed, like in token functions, doesn't make a lot of sense in conditions. What you can do with lightweight transactions. Uh, by the way, all of these features and restrictions so far are pretty similar to Cassandra. I'm going to talk about the differences uh, and some of the limitations we also inherited to be compatible with Cassandra. So you can't use counter data type, it doesn't make sense. You can't uh, span, your lightweight transactions cannot span multiple partitions. Um, multiple partitions may reside on, several different partitions may reside on different nodes. So we don't do cross node transactions yet. Maybe we'll get to it some, sometime. Uh, you cannot supply a custom time, timestamp. This actually uh, upsets the entire logic of lightweight transactions. You can supply unlocked clause. It's ignored, so it's, uh, the lightweight transactions are always logged. They always are written to the commit log. So how are we different? I would like to conclude with a few differences that we have with Cassandra. There aren't, aren't that many. We try to preserve uh, compatibility where it made sense. There is one case which I would like to highlight. So 
I'm sorry. So there, there is coming a good part. Uh, Scylla always provides a result set. What it means? Let's look at this uh, example. Here you can see a result set of the batch statement. The result set contains of the execution state, like whether the uh, mutation is applied or not, and also the value of the old record that was used to check the conditions. So Cassandra, for some reason, does not return the old record if uh, the condition is applied. This makes life quite messy on the client side because you cannot use prepared statements with lightweight transactions. We decided if we always return a result set, we are going to be compatible with most cases so, and make the, the client's life easier for, for drivers. So this is one inconsistency that we have and maybe we get feedback that this was not a, not a good idea and we fix it or introduce a switch. But so far we thought we're just gonna do it better. So let's look at performance. As I said, this is not great, but this is fair and this is pretty good and I can this is obviously better than Cassandra, but uh, so just like, let's take a look at it. We used a couple of setups for performance. Uh, jumping ahead, uh, the performance is dominated by latency and by CPU availability. So it's CPU bound and latency bound. Uh, this is the description of the first uh, uh, setup. It's within the same data center, so the latency is quite low. These are three rather Mm, small to medium nodes that we used, but they do showcase the, uh, the, basically the bottlenecks and the limits of lightweight transactions. So this is a setup of, within a single data center, and then we'll look at the multi-DC set, setup. And we use concurrent connections to see, to, ba to basically look at the throughput. How many statements can we get with lightweight transactions? And please bear in mind, it's the first implementation, so we're going to work on performance. We compare lightweight transaction performance with eventual consistency performance. You can see the, what is interesting on this chart is like hitting the scalability limit. You can see that 20 clients, we almost reached it. 40 clients, we saturated the scalability limit. We uh, reached around 10,000 transactions per second, and then it, it becomes flat and if you look at the latency, the latency becomes worse. The reason the latency becomes worse is that the, the CPU gets more and more saturated, so more and more statements wait in the queue before they even can, can get to, 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 to execution. So, uh, and the, the scalability, currently we also see that uh, the scalability of eventually consist, I'm sorry, I need to get used to that clicker. So the scalability of eventually consistent statements is uh, much better. Obviously, this is the first approach to the target, and we are going to, to make sure that you know, we don't get uh, flat that quick. But uh, bear in mind that just we will look at the internals. The work that needs to be done to ensure consistency is pretty much, four, there are four times more work than with eventual consistency that needs to be done. Plus, the lightweight transaction has to do read. And remember, I said a read is very expensive. So uh, this is uncontended case. What if we try to hit the same key from multiple clients? Things are not shiny here either. So, and this, is, uh, this, is, this chart is probably number one reason why we have dash dash experimental switch still. So if you try to hit the same key, you can only get to 500 queries per second. That's the max, regardless of how much hardware you use. So this has to do with the liveness of the protocol, the Paxos protocol. One of the most, it's very elegant, but it's very hard to understand protocol in distributed computing. We'll, if, I hope we'll get to it. So, uh, and the latency is also not good. So. This is, this is in milliseconds, so we basically time out if we have a lot of clients. I should say that the industry and the academia has solutions for this. It just, uh, it's a very fresh feature, and I'm sure that in the upcoming months we will fix that too. So the se second setup is multiple regions. Uh, the RTT time is 20 milliseconds. 
what is good about it's uh, what is good about this benchmark is that it demonstrates that you don't actually pay in CPU costs for using multiple regions. You pay in throughput. It takes more time to saturate the system, so we need, I'm sorry, we need 1,500 clients to actually reach the 10,000 queries per second on this setup. But we still reach the same 10,000 queries per second. That's an important part. And the scalability also here, the, you can see that uh, with 3,000 clients, we can actually get to 100,000 uh, eventually consistent statements, but only 10,000 of uh, lightweight transactions per second. The latency uh, behaves in expected way. Here we see latency grows primarily because the CPU is saturated, so queries have to wait, out, wait outside the system before they get into the system. We added some metrics to uh, help monitor usage of lightweight transactions. These metrics will soon appear on our standard Grafana dashboards. Uh, the important part is uh, metrics for the coordinator. There are some histograms and counters for basically issues. So everything here is important. Latency spikes, timeouts, unavailable errors, contention errors, unfinished commits, and also conditions not met, meaning that you are supplying a change that is not applied. So you're probably doing some useless work. This is a screenshot of metrics going up and down during our torturing of the cluster. So let's take a look under the hood. You probably heard uh, at previous Scylla Summit by the way, how many people actually are here from the previous summit? So quite a few. And you probably heard at previous Scylla summit that Scylla is uh, going to use Raft consensus protocol for lightweight transactions. We, like jumping ahead, we changed that decision. We are still working on Raft. And I will, in the end, I will look at how we are going to use Raft and for what. But uh, let me explain why we do not use Raft for lightweight transactions. Scylla is a shared nothing architecture. Uh, this is a classical picture of the consistent hash ring. You, can ha you have multiple nodes on the ring, so you hash the partition key and get the token. The token is somewhere on the, on the ring. Then you hash the node ID, and you also place it on the ring. And uh, every node is responsible for a range of tokens on the consistent hash. Every, every, everybody knows that. Now we add V nodes. The reason we add V nodes, uh, how many people are not familiar with v, with v nodes, actually? So everybody is familiar with that, right? So the reason we add them is because we want to even out the token ranges between uh, physical nodes. Let's take a look at it from replication point of view. Every V node has a primary replica responsible for it and a couple of secondaries uh, which are selected as a product of a hash function. If you have a lot of V nodes, then you have a lot of combinations of uh, primary and secondary. So you have, what, let's call them replication groups as academia calls this, these replication groups. So the more V nodes you have, the more replication groups you have. There are two classes of protocols, uh, leader-based protocols and leaderless protocols. Leader-based protocols basically say, for, for isolation, for consistency, pro consistency protocols, they basically say, hey, let's select a leader once, and this leader is going to make a decision which transaction goes first, which transaction goes se second. It will decide on the global order of transactions. Leaderless protocols say, hey, let's select a leader for every transaction. Obviously, the advantage of a leader-based protocol is that you don't have to select a leader on every transaction. You don't have to have this extra round of negotiations. The disadvantage is that you have to keep a state who the leader is, is it alive or not, what's the latest transaction for every leader. Now, we have V nodes, we have lots of replication groups. A repli the number of replication groups is actually a binomial coefficient of the number of V nodes. So for, say, 16, 16 V nodes and replication factor of three, it's 560 replication group. 
for 2,560 vnodes, it's already a lot. A lot of state to maintain. And uh, let's not forget another property of Scylla. Unlike Cassandra, we don't stop at vnodes. We actually have C nodes. C nodes is a name for, uh, so every vnode is partitioned within a node because we have shards. So we slice every vnode across all of the shards so that every shard owns a piece of vnode. And we slice it m many, many times. It's not like we slice it once, not twice, but 4,000 times. So every vnode is very carefully, carefully sliced across, node, across shards. So the number of groups, if we, if we directly apply raft paradigm to Scylla, it's just not gonna work. Too much state to maintain with leaders. So we had to use leaderless uh, protocol. Leaderless protocols are more robust. They don't need a state, but you pay for it with an extra round of negotiations, as I said. Let's take a look at how it works. Paxos is a protocol for, it was invented for you know, distributed networks, decision making, unreliable networks. It was not invented for replications, but it is often used and it can be used for replication. When you look at how it's used for replication, you can see that Paxos is actually an umbrella term. There are lots of adaptations uh, and adjustments to make it work in database environment. But one thing is certain, before you can actually choose a value, choose a new, a new a, a, apply a new mutation, you need to negotiate who is going to do that. That's the first round of Paxos. Imagine you don't do it. Then so may happen that one replica actually accept one mutation, another replica accept another, and this is irreversible. So you, your, your history of changes splits and you cannot reconcile it ever. So first you need to sort of lock everybody out, and this is done by a concept which is called ballots. So uh, the replica which acts on behalf of the client says, could you promise me to accept the value if I come up with it? And other replicas do reply, hey, okay. If there is no contention, they reply, okay, I will accept the value. The second round of Paxos is, okay, I got the majority of responses. I know I locked everybody out. I'm going to propose a new value for this role. And uh, if everything is good, if no timeouts, no crashes, nothing, nothing like that, then a majority of replicas responds, okay, we accept that mutation. We basically accept your proposal for a new value, for a new version of the record. And finally, when the coordinator knows, so it's like the decision, this is a distributed state machine. Uh, it, its state is changed as soon as the majority of replicas accept the value. But when the state is changed, it's not like everybody knows the state is changed. We need another, uh, another round of responses. We need to collect responses to actually find this out. So when we find this out, the coordinator is then responsible for saying, hey, I know that the decision is made, let's actually store the mutation in the base table. So this is the learn round. And since we have lightweight transactions, conditions and stuff, we have an extra round when we actually need to retrieve a record and uh, check the conditions. Uh, these two rounds, they could be collapsed and we are working on making sure that we actually collapse them into a single one. As you can see from this like saga style decision making, uh, there are some flaws in this approach, right? So what are they and how to live with them? One is that this is a quite an expensive, we have seen that in benchmarks, we have seen it in the diagrams, it's an expensive thing. So use, with, use it wisely for the stuff that is really requires uh, consistency and not all of this stuff in your, in, in your application. And we are going to work on reducing the number of rounds and reducing efficiency. The second issue is the starvation that I demonstrated with benchmarks. Uh, there are actually solutions for that. It's called Paxos leases uh, and it reduces starvation quite a bit. I, I hope you are going to get to it quite soon. So this is on us. 
Uh, the third issue that you need to be aware of is this new, the, like, new state that you need to handle. With eventual consistency, you can always retry. You, you know that if you supply the same mutation with the same timestamp, well, well, actually, you, do, you can't. You can't always retry anyway. So, but the, there is this uh, uh, extra, extra uh, with Paxos, there is this extra uncertainty that is in the system. You, naturally, we expect a database to execute a query exactly once. And if there is a, an execution failure, we expect that there is a failure, the query was not applied. But this is not always true. You can actually get a failure, but the database actually stores the record. Well, you got the failure afterwards. You know, it's committed, it's written to replicas, but then you just didn't get the message back. And with Paxos, chances for this to occur are much higher. And you need to be aware of it. So you can get a timeout, but the uh, a timeout error, but the mutation is actually accepted and successfully committed. Many users are actually surprised by that. So, uh, and one thing we can do on the database side so that you don't get so many of these mes messages is to provide you with good diagnostics when this happens. So you can actually understand where and what happened and make decisions accordingly. Finally, the, the Paxos uh, needs to store, persist the intermediate state somewhere. So all of this is not just, hey, here is the ballot, here is the, the, the promise. This is all persistent, so that if a node crashes or restarts, this is preserved across restarts. And we add a new system tables to store this state. This system table uh, has a TTL. The default TTL for expiration is like three hours, but you still need to account for it in capacity planning uh, because it stores basically three hours of in-flight transactions. And we might actually also work on reducing the uh, amount of state you have to store to remove the data that is already successfully applied from the table uh, proactively. So having said that, you can probably sense I'm not very happy with some of the caveats. And uh, as I mentioned before, we uh, are working on Raft as well. So a few things about, a few words, uh, concluding words about Scylla Raft. It turns out that it's much easier to work on Raft uh, implementation if you don't mix uh, compatibility issues into into, the, into this uh, problem. So if we can work on Raft tables as a standalone tables, that which are always consistent, which are partitioned in a friendly to Raft manner, then we can uh, provide uh, efficiency and consistency for all queries, not just conditional queries, which has its own benefits. And we, so this is the current state of mind of the, some of the key engineers, and uh, I hope we, we're going to pursue it this way. Thank you.